Coming up on Tech News Weekly, Emily Forlini is here, and we kick off the show with an interesting story of the week. Uh, one man asked, am I the problem in my relationship where my girlfriend uses chat GPT to win every argument? Then an important but unfortunate story about the effects of an AI chatbot on one teen and a conversation about using generative AI to replace conversation and interaction with society. Afterwards, Nick Steele, the staff product manager of 1Password and the Fido Alliance co-chair, and David Turner, senior technical director of standards development for the Fido Alliance, join me to talk about passkeys portability. It's a great and nerdy conversation you're going to love. Before we round things out with Dan Morin of Six Colors, who joins us to talk about what we can expect in an upcoming version of iOS 18 and Apple's new, new Apple intelligence tools. All of that coming up on Tech News Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 359, with Emily Forlini and me, Micah Sargent. Recorded Thursday, October 24th, 2024. Fido Alliance explains passkeys portability. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and breaking that tech news. I am your host, Micah Sargent, and I am joined on this very episode by my wonderful co-host, it's Emily Forlini. Welcome to the show, Emily. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so good to have you here uh, with us this week. And, you know, for folks who are tuning in for the first time, uh, a little something, something about how the show works. We kick off the show with our stories of the week. These are uh, stories that we've seen or written in some cases uh, that we think are pretty cool or are important to be talking about. And so we take that time to kind of break them down, discuss them. And it kicks off, I think, on a a nice light note to a certain extent, although this can get pretty serious. Emily, why don't you tell us about your story of the week? All right. So I have a story that I wrote about for PC Mag. I'm a staff writer at PC Mag and I write about AI. And this is one of my favorite AI topics because it's just so much to debate and discuss. So this is about a guy who came and posted on Reddit. There's a Reddit subreddit called Am I the so it's kind of like an advice giving chat. And he went on there and I, I will read a little bit of his post. I'll just take a minute. So he's 25. His girl's girlfriend is 28. They've been dating for eight months. He says, each time we argue, my girlfriend will go away and discuss the argument with chat GPT, even doing so in the same room sometimes. She then comes back with a quote, well-constructed argument, breaking down everything I said or did. I've explained to her I don't like her doing that as I feel like I am being ambushed by the thoughts and opinions from a robot. He goes on to say when he tells her he doesn't like this, she responds with, well, ChatGPT says you're insecure or ChatGPT says you don't have the emotional bandwidth. And he closes with saying one of his biggest issues is he worries that she's formulating the prompts to chat GPT in a way that turns it against him and does not oh. present both sides of the issue. Finally, he says, am I the for asking her to stop using chat GPT in this context? <laughs> this is so sad because there's the part of it where the part when he says, um, I'm worried that he, she's formulating it in such a way that I don't have uh, you know, that my, my opinion is not heard or whatever. That is so much like if the, if your significant other goes and talks to, uh, a friend or an in-law for God's sake, and you are worried that the way that they're presenting it is different. The thought, see, and there's that aspect of it, of these systems are just that systems. They're not human beings. And so they don't really care <laughs> what you know what you feel or how you feel or really judge you at all and in that sense it's like it wouldn't matter if she perfectly 
said exactly your point of view and then hers, if she formulates the the prompt in a way that says, look, he's right, but I need to be right. So help me figure out how to say it so that I'm right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's also funny to use your example, like if someone goes to their friends or family, it's almost like they're telling their side of the story, like their, their prompt, like they're already mm. turning people against the partner. Um, so it's just interesting, like, why is this different than that? Or why is this different than just Googling relationship advice? And I think the answer is that she's putting in exactly what happened in the argument, or she's saying, you know, I went out with my friends, and I didn't tell him when I was coming back, and he got upset. And so you can kind of do this more interactive talk with the chat bot and get more into these details versus just a Google search, where she maybe would be more generic relationship advice. So maybe he feels even more attacked and she's using it as ammo basically against him. And I, I don't know, where do you come down? Do you think, yeah. do you think she's the, or he is? And well, also, I don't you, know if we can say that on this show, so maybe I'll stop saying. That. Um, I know we've said it a lot now. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I think that the A word on its own is okay, but I can't remember if when it's paired with the with whole that that's what makes it uh, a beeper. Mm. But I think we'll just bleep it out just to be safe. Um, so here's the thing: when you first shared this with me, I thought that is diabolical. Uh, in fact, that's what I said. Um, but I really do think that. There is, uh, this has so many issues outside of just using uh, using ChatGPT, right? Because there are, there are a couple of things here. You have to ask yourself, has in the past, the gentleman who's written this post um, made her feel like she wasn't being heard or that even whenever she was arguing perfectly and wonderfully that he somehow still came out, quote unquote, winning the argument, right? And... So why did she decide to turn to ChatGPT uh, in this situation? And then you have the situation or the, the issue of like, this isn't a relationship disagreement at this point. It is trying to argue for winning the argument. And if there's one thing I've learned from every single Instagram uh, video that talks about relationships, because that seems to be where all of the advice exists is on, on Instagram, it's that you don't argue to win. You argue to better understand one another and come to a resolution. And in that case, I do think that makes her the a-hole specifically in, if we look at this in a vacuum, um, because here we go again, is he prompting us with the, the, the issue from his side without providing the clear details? Ooh. You know what I mean? He could right. be overall the a-hole who has pushed her to right. a place where she feels like the only way I can win an argument, again, win an argument, which should not be the goal, is to go here. At the same time, I don't think that it's a terrible idea to get some advice if it's needed and to help kind of, especially when people feel like what they're trying to say and what they're saying are two very different things and they kind of have themselves going, why is it that every time I say this, and it's well-meaning in my head, the person takes it and they just, you know, don't get it. I think looking for more um, understanding of the significant other is a really admirable way to use the system. But yeah, there's also something to be said. Uh, in fact, this is one of the first times where I'm like, oh, uh, I want to pull up a, a comment that somebody said in the uh, Discord because uh, they said the part about her doing it in front of him is passive aggressive. And I absolutely agree. That does make it feel a little bit like, okay, this isn't you and the person listening to one another. This is, right. this is, yeah. What, what are your thoughts though? Um, I agree. Because I don't want to make I... you feel, feel a type of way if you have used ChatGPT in an argument. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's inappropriate to do that. And um, I, I agree with you. It can be helpful. Like ChatGPT could help formulate ways to better express yourself or encourage you to, you know, s express your needs kind of like, hey, I didn't like that you did that. It would, I would appreciate, you know, just like softening and language. It could help tell people and give some communication skills. There are some things that are basics, basics of relationships that we forget. And maybe ChatGPT could help. 
But at the same time, like what she's doing isn't working and I can put myself in her shoes. And if my partner was doing that to me, I would be very annoyed. And I think that they, they're clearly struggling, but just the way that she's doing this is not helping them to fight better. Like she's, she's pissing him off. So Mm -hmm. she might be getting good information, but there's a difference between wielding it like an ax and like sitting down at breakfast the morning, next morning and being like, Hey, I thought about it. I looked at this online. This is resonating with me. I feel like we could discuss it. And I just want to know if you think there's any validity to it. Like that's, that's a totally different thing than like coming, leaving the room and coming back with like a new crazy argument and being like, well, chat GPT said this, which is just super annoying. Right? Yeah, exactly. Cause that's, again, that's not me. That's not me saying, uh, this is how I feel. That's well, uh, I have consulted a third party in right. this situation and this right. is what they have to say. And then how do you even argue? Because the then I'm arguing with this machine that is always going to yeah. be able to give the answer that it is asked to give. So you could have yes. a perfect, perfect, perfect argument. And I could ask ChatGPT, give me five ways that I can defeat this argument. And it's probably going to come <laughs> up with those. And so the, my bigger concern is what happens when now both people are using the system and then no one's actually talking to each other. This is mm-hmm. just, this is not the way it should go. And I honestly, no. I, I've only ever thought, it, it's kind of interesting given um, how much I've seen what I'm about to say that I never had considered this aspect of it because what I have seen ChatGPT used for is people who uh, are are using like online apps to, to find someone to, to date. And when they are struggling to figure out what they want to say to the person, they'll use uh, yeah. some sort of AI to help come up with some responses or at least give them ideas of what they could possibly say. And so that seems more, even though there's, you know, there's some negativity there, that seems more like a positive use of it. And so I never really considered, oh, what about when you're in an argument and you're trying Hmm. to, because people do use this if they, you know, for example, let's say they have a boss who is, um, I don't know, like narcissistic and is, um, is trying to like, every time you talk to them, they, they say, no, let's just say that. And so they talk to chat GPT and say, I have a narcissistic boss who almost always says no to anything that I ask, but I really need a raise. Um, what are some ways that I can stroke the narcissistic ego and <laughs> circumvent the no? Uh, and then it can come up with a bunch of ideas to help you. And that seems like a very positive manipulation. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so I don't yeah. know, it can be helpful. I like that. I, I almost disagree with I would not be happy if someone I was talking to on a dating app was using chat GPT to talk to me because I don't want to get the impression that some guys like super witty like always making jokes always on it and then I get to the the coffee shop or the bar or whatever for a drink and he's like completely flat and has no idea what to say I feel like that's a little deceptive in this case I like it maybe a little more because it's just advice and you can do with it what you will mm-hmm yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, some 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 advice is not a bad idea, but um, yeah, I don't think I recommend this overall. That's that's how I feel about it, and I have a no. feeling you know this is going to be an interesting thing for therapists now who are going. Oh, it's another case of using AI to try to win arguments. Oof, we've got a lot that we need to break down here. <laughs> exactly. I, I mean, of course, compared to therapy, it's it's free or it appears free. They're collecting right. your data. You don't have to make an appointment. Finding a therapist can just take so much time and effort. So it's tempting. It's tempting. Um, but it's just such a weird moment in society where like people are or, you know, going in the closet and asking ChatGPT and like coming back out with <laughs> I have to use the restroom. <laughs> a new weapon. Yeah. Like, Just oh, while I was using the restroom, I thought about <laughs> this <laughs> smoking gun. Oh, yes. Dear. Well, maybe. Like, go ahead. <laughs> well, I think they'll probably break up. 
<laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, yeah. if if she's doing this and he's turning to Reddit, I think they're yeah. both lost. My and they need boyfriend to- <laughs> posted our uh, secret details on Reddit and I need to know what I should say back. Right. Like, well, you've been right. sharing all of those details with me, chat GPT. Right. So we I mean, also... My boyfriend posted it on Reddit and someone made uh, an article out of it. <laughs> I mean, it's just escalating. This is And now it's on a podcast. To... Now it's on a podcast. Oh no. Whoever you are out there, if you're listening, <laughs> come join us. Let's talk. <laughs> yeah, let's talk. If, yeah, reach out. I'd love to hear more. All right. We're going to take a quick break before we come back with my story of the week. Uh, far more somber, uh, but also about AI. But I do want to tell you about Threat Locker, who are bringing you this episode of Tech News Weekly. Um, I think I probably know the answer to the question I'm about to ask, and it's yes. Uh, Do zero-day exploits and supply chain attacks keep you up at night? Well, if you have to worry about zero-day exploits and supply chain attacks, yeah, I imagine they probably keep you up at night. But you can worry no more by hardening your security with ThreatLocker. Worldwide, companies like JetBlue trust ThreatLocker to secure their data and keep their business operations flying high. You know, let's think about taking a proactive, deny-by-default approach to cybersecurity, blocking every action, every process, every user, unless they're actually authorized by your team. ThreatLocker helps you do this and provides a full audit of every action for risk management and compliance. Its 24-7 US-based support team fully supports onboarding and beyond, so you can stop the exploitation of trusted applications within your organization and keep your business secure and protected from ransomware. Organizations across any industry can benefit from ThreatLocker's ring fencing They isolate critical and trusted applications from unintended uses or weaponization and limit attackers' lateral movement within the network. I remember talking to ThreatLocker about ring fencing and really being blown away by its capabilities because ring fencing was actually able to foil a number of attacks that were not stopped by traditional EDR. In fact, the 2020 cyber attack on SolarWinds Orion, yeah, it was foiled by ring fencing. And I should mention, the threat locker works for Max as well. So get unprecedented visibility and control of your cybersecurity quickly, easily, and cost effectively. ThreatLocker's zero trust endpoint protection platform offers a unified approach to protecting users, devices, and networks against the exploitation of zero day vulnerabilities. Get a free 30 day trial and learn more about how ThreatLocker can help mitigate unknown threats and ensure compliance. Visit threatlocker.com. That's threatlocker. Dot com. And we thank ThreatLocker for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. I am sharing a content warning. The following story discusses the sensitive topic of suicide involving a minor. If you or someone you know is having thoughts of suicide or self-harm, please contact the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. You can call or text 988 or chat online at chat.988lifeline.org. If you are located outside of the United States, please visit findahelpline.com to find a helpline in your country. All right, we are back from the break. I am joined by Emily Forlini of PC Mag, and we are talking about our stories of the week. Um, my story of the week comes from the New York Times, and it is um, a really sad story. Uh, but it's a story that has kind of a bigger a bigger conversation uh, that needs to take place or that is taking place. Um, There was a 14 year old Florida boy who was using character.ai. Character.ai is a service that lets you uh, create and also uh, sort of tap into different bots that exist, different generative AI bots that exist. And you are able to communicate with them in a chat format. So for example, you might have a bot that's called therapist and you could pop in and it's been hopefully, and in theory trained with, uh, cognitive, uh, therapy and, uh, it is cognitive behavioral therapy is the word I was looking for. Uh, and it is going to provide responses based on what you send to it about what you are feeling. Um, And 
So when it comes to this piece, uh, this is talking about an individual who was talking to a, a chat bot that was named after a character from Game of Thrones. And um, over a period of many, many, many months uh, communicating with this bot and slowly but surely uh, kind of, according to family and friends, uh, stepping away from his friends away from his family, getting home from school, heading to his room, talking to this bot. Um, the 14 year old ninth grader, uh, after a period of time of, of, of communicating with his bot, uh, ended up taking his own life. Um, and the, the, the conversation here is about, well, one instance of uh, character AI in particular, how responsible is this company for what has happened? How responsible are parents uh, for what has happened? Uh, the overall argument about how uh, teens are becoming more anxious with the, the stuff that they have access to online and whether or not social media has an impact on that. But now we also have AI systems that allow you in some ways to get what you would get from socialization without necessarily being part of society. Um, I wanted to, to kind of talk about this in, in a broader sense, of course, because there are, there have been for a long time, uh, little chat bots, even before this generative AI craze, there were chat bots that you could talk to that some were somewhat okay, some were not okay, uh, in terms of, of their, their power and their ability to respond with something that seemed uh, like it was actually responding to what you were saying. And so this technology in some forms have, has existed for a long time. But I think what makes it unique is truly the uniqueness that is at play here and how it does end up feeling like you're talking to a person. I, um, after having Amanda Silberling on the show, Amanda had talked about uh, a different app that also featured some of this functionality where you could create little characters and then they worked in like a social media format where they would post but then you could also talk to them in direct messages and you could actually have multiple bots kind of all together in a group chat. And I'm not going to lie, I found it compelling when I was testing it out. And I thought, oh, wow, I could see how this could be something that somebody gets drawn into. Um, it's important to note that uh, in this instance, uh, the the teen was diagnosed with mild Asperger's syndrome as a child, uh, did not have behavioral or mental health problems, serious behavioral or mental health problems, um, was diagnosed with anxiety and disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Um, so there were some other issues that were potentially exacerbated by character AI. We've looked in the past at what responsibility a social network has for different things. And that is something that's still being figured out. Now we have to look at generative AI systems and the companies behind them and look at what they, uh, what their responsibility is. And you, Emily, as someone who covers AI, um, I wanted to just kind of check in with you about, well, A, your overall thoughts on this, but also kind of, how you maybe see um, the legalities playing out in any way and what what AI companies are kind of doing uh, when it comes to situations like this. Yeah, this is really devastating. And I'm sure the parents had no idea that the technology could be so good that their teen was doing this. Um, I think another important detail is that 
the Daenerys Targaryen was the character that they were kind of acting like they were in love or in some kind of relationship. And he proposed to her that he was going to do this to himself. And one of her responses basically was implying, let's, we'll do it together. We'll go away together. So there's an element of the system encouraging him that's really concerning. And I don't know that we know the full legalities of that, but I will say a week before this came out, I interviewed my, my first time talking to a CEO of a very similar company. And I asked him, you know, how, how do you know that these chats aren't going off the rails? How do you know that an AI bot or an AI bot friend group are not encouraging a disturbed young boy to carry out a mass shooting? How do you know what's going on in these chat bots and that these very real situations could encourage someone in a bad direction? And he did not have any systematic way of flagging chats that are very obviously problematic. He was like, oh, well, I talk to users and users tell me that their chats mm. are, um, you know, helping them out of depression, that they're encouraging them to go to therapy, that they are talking to them about niche interests like underground ukuleles. They're, they're talking to them about random stuff that they can't find a human to talk to about. And so he was really highlighting the pros, but I thought it was very telling. He did not have an, a systematic way to basically a defect detection system to flag these scenarios and stop them. And mm. there's also an issue here of uh, teens and like how old should you be to be able to interact with these systems? Um, and even if a system says, yeah, you can't can't make a character dot AI account until you're 18. I mean, they have absolutely no way of verifying that. So now we have, and same for Instagram, Facebook, whatever, that's an ongoing issue on the internet. So it's just top to bottom, I think, uh, a disturbing trend in society that we need to deal with. I, we see Meta has uh, AI characters that, you know, are fake, basically. It's just something popping up all over the place. And I'm, I'm, I think this is a very worthy lawsuit. I don't think we know where it, it will go, but I think it's very good they filed it and it raises a lot of questions that need to be answered because from what I'm hearing, there's pretty much nothing in place that could prevent this from happening again. And no, nobody wants this in their life. This is just a terrible thing. Absolutely. And that's the thing is like, I, I feel for... I feel for the parents or parent here in the situation, in this uh, instance that you don't, sometimes you don't, you think that everything's okay until it's not, right? And if you, what you're talking about where these are kind of systems that are just running rampant to a certain extent, I mean, it's interesting, the New York Times quotes some of the conversation and there are parts of it where uh the 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 chatbot says you know i don't want you because actually the 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 teen said i'm thinking about killing myself and the chatbot responds to say why in the world would you do that you know very angry very upset but you can't count on it always doing that and you can't count on it picking up on the subtleties where you know, me reading the message that was the last message, and I'm not going to because it's it's something that I want people to have the choice to read or not read. Um, the last message to me as a human being has a lot more subtext than this chatbot is able to pick up on. And so the chatbot becomes very encouraging of what the teen is saying to the chatbot. And then the child you know, takes his life. And I think that that is one aspect of this that is just, it's scary, just, just plain scary. And as a person who runs a company, I think that it should be scary to them, not this, yes. oh, well, I hear from my users and, you know, they're doing this and they're doing that. No, you should be petrified that, something like this would happen for the purpose of making sure there are as many guardrails in place as there possibly can be. The idea that you can just kind of wash your hands of it and say, oh, people will do what they do with it is not, is not acceptable. And what, <laughs> what becomes clear to me, 
and has always, you know, has been clear to many people uh, for sure, is that it takes object lessons for humans to change things. And it's so frustrating that that's the case. Um, and it's unfortunate that things like this happen. When they do, it is sometimes the, the you know, the thing that makes the difference in terms of making, you know, character AI, we hope, petrified that something like this could happen again, so that this they do something to make these systems more responsible. It should not take this for them to make changes, but it does, unfortunately. Um, and so that that is what we're left with is the hope that something as as awful as this does make a change um, for these companies. And, you know, in some cases it doesn't. <laughs> and that's even more frustrating um, when you're just kind of looking at it and you're going, this could be better, this could be fixed. This There are so many ways to look at this and they're not doing anything. And so in that way, I'm glad that the New York Times is reported on this because mm -hmm. it'll get in front of more people, more people's eyes. I agree. Um, we are at the end um, of our conversation for this week. Uh, of course, folks can head over to PC Mag to check out the wonderful work that you do. Is there anywhere they can go to follow you online to keep up to date with what you've got going on? Yes, you can follow me on Twitter. You can follow me on TikTok. It's at Emily Forlini on both. Um, you can just read my stuff on PC Mag. You don't have to follow me. Just check it out. Send me an email. Um, I'd be happy to hear from you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you. See you again soon. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to take another quick break before we come back with a really exciting conversation about passkeys portability from the folks who are making it possible. But first, let's take a quick break so I can tell you about our next sponsor. That is Shopify, who are bringing you this episode of Tech News Weekly. When you think about businesses whose sales are rocketing, like all birds or untuck it, you think about an innovative product, a progressive brand, and buttoned down marketing. But an often overlooked secret is actually the businesses behind the business making selling and for shoppers buying simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. <laughs> Nobody does sales better than Shopify, home of the number one checkout on the planet and the not so secret secret with ShopPay that boosts conversions up to 50%. That means way less carts going abandoned and way more sales being made. So, if you're into growing your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell wherever your customers are scrolling or strolling on the web, in your store, in their feed, and everywhere in between. Businesses that sell more sell on Shopify. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout that Allbirds uses. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash twit, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash twit to upgrade your selling today. Shopify dot com slash twit. All right, we are back from the break, and I am very excited for the next conversation we're about to have. I do have a little disclosure. Um, 1Password is a sponsor of the network. However, our sales team and our editorial team are two separate uh, instances of the company, and my decision to have someone from 1Password on the show today uh, was not influenced by the fact that 1Password is a sponsor on the network. Uh, joining us today to talk about passkeys portability, well, credential portability, uh, two individuals involved with the FIDO Alliance. We have Nick Steele, staff product manager of 1Password, as well as FIDO Alliance co-chair, and David Turner, senior technical director of standards development at the FIDO Alliance. Welcome, both of you, to the show. Thanks, Micah. Yeah, really thanks for having us. Yeah, great to have you here. So I'm going to uh, kind of ask a question and I'll let you both uh, answer it as you see fit. And we'll just keep doing that. So that way we avoid kind of crosstalk. 
Uh, so we'll kick it off. I was hoping that in talking about this credential portability, we can talk about um, breaking down the kind of key problem that these new specifications are trying to solve. Why has credential migration between providers historically been such a challenge? Yeah. Um, oh, oh, yeah. No, David, take it away. No. Oh. <laughs> Well, the, the problem is that, that everybody keeps it into their, in their own ecosystem. And uh, while that works really great within the ecosystem, there are a lot of challenges when you try to shift ecosystems. Uh, if you want to go, say, between Apple and uh, uh, Android, uh, or even if you have reason to move between different uh, passkey providers, uh, there are barriers to doing that. And the solutions that are out there tend to be very insecure. You basically save things to text files uh, to your to your local machine, and that's a really bad thing to do with with important credentials. And on the mobile uh, on mobile devices, there's largely no way to do that at all. So it's kind of solving two parts of the problem: making it more the capabilities more broadly available to the industry, and at the same time, uh, making it a very secure way to exchange the data. Yeah, right now the kind of default across um, the industry is to export a CSV. Um, it's unencrypted, unformatted. Um, it's generally a, a pain in the butt, not just for users, but for uh, companies in the credential management space to to marshal and format these files. And sometimes that data gets lost. So there's no guarantees right now that your credentials, when they move from A to B, you know, when you get a new phone and a, potentially a new credential manager, um, say you're moving, you know, from from an iPhone to to an Android device, that those credentials are going to be all be able to be imported or exported properly. Um, additionally, you know, it's it's it, credential exchange is not just about import export migration. It's about shareability, right? If if you have uh, one password today and someone else has Dashlane and you want to share a credential, well, it, there's there's no great way of doing that. So. If I want to share something with, you know, my mom, who's actually a Dashlane user, um, what? Uh, I, yeah, well, it, it, it's I, I use a few, so I'm, you know, I'm not picking favorites. <laughs> um, but the uh, the the process is, you know, she has to go either uh, download one password or, or or the credential manager that is I'm trying to share with, or she needs to copy paste the credential, or I need to copy it to her, you know, in a in a separate chat, which undermines the whole reason for having a manager in the first place. Mm -hmm. Now, I, something that stood out to me, uh, the specifications mentioned 12 billion, with a B, online accounts that can now be accessed with pass keys. You know, I, the, the narrative seems to be that there are still very few accounts out there that support pass keys, uh, but that's quite a few. So how significant is this standardization effort for accelerating actual pass key adoption across the industry? Uh, it, it's critical. I mean, when you look at, you know, Google's already announced 800 million users have access to pass keys and Microsoft's rolled it out to all of their uh, MSN uh, users and, uh, you know, Amazon's announced like 175 million people. Uh, when you start adding up, that's that's three. And, and then Apple uh, and their ecosystem is about one and a half billion users. Um, that's, you know, already you're at two and a half, three billion. And that's just three accounts. You know, everyone always talks about the number of accounts they've got there. And an effort like this requires standardization because if you, well, you know, if you only have one, of course, it's useless. But even if you just have two uh, vendors involved, it, it still has little value. What you really need is it to be as available and as well integrated as the rest of the ecosystem because that then removes the barriers to adoption. You know, anytime you're trying to use a new technology, there's the technology itself and then there's how do you use use the technology and the ability to move the passwords around is an important part of this whole ecosystem. And so having a secure way to do that is a really, really important key to getting this more broadly deployed. Something a little nerdy. Um, the specifications address both secure protocol, CXP, and standardized format, CXF. I was hoping you could explain why both components are necessary for this credential exchange to work as it needs to. Yeah, absolutely. So the the, the credential exchange protocol just defines how we can securely and privately move credentials from A to B. Um, but what's really critical, right, is that that same thing I was talking about earlier on, right, is we all need to be able to speak the same language once the credentials move because we may get dropped data. Um, this is really critical and, and, and kind of new to, to, to 
the space of being able to move credentials right is that we're going to start defining formats for how credentials should look in in you know in code or really just in JSON um, for how how they should be moved, stored, and securely backed up. Uh, this doesn't just help with exchange itself and sharing, but you know for uh, the long-term format and storage of credentials and, 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 and data related to identity, this is necessary. You know, there's, there's other standards like SCIM2 uh, that exist for managing and formatting identity information about users. The same needs to exist for credentials. Now, I, you look at the list of participating companies, and it's, you know, Apple, Google, password managers like 1Password, which is the password manager I use, Bitwarden. Um, was it how difficult was it to get these companies on board i guess more what i'm asking is did everybody kind of go this is something that we really just need to make happen and so it was just easy to kind of get everybody on board or was it a little bit like pulling teeth if you can answer that <laughs> yeah I, I can i can talk about that one so um pretty much everyone in the press release is already a member of the fido alliance where we define you know the infrastructure and such for pass keys and so we already have all of those people having conversations about making pass keys work they're already invested in the ecosystem and so it wasn't a big leap and it was was a pretty clear step to say yeah we need to be able to move this stuff around so it for the people that we were already engaged with who are already members it actually wasn't a big step uh, because, as I said, they, they're already doing this work. They already know what their customers need and, and, quite frankly, are asking for. And so, you know, yeah, there's always battles about what's in the spec and, you know, how does that fit within an ecosystem and so on. But uh, at the conceptual level, we had pretty much everyone on board pretty quickly. And it's, it's been a very it's been a very positive collaboration, uh, which is always great to see. Yeah, I think that's one of the things I love about working in the FIDO Alliance the most is I've, I've been involved in FIDO for, for eight years and I've been in standards for, for, for 10 as, as a whole across a lot of different bodies, but it's a really collaborative nature. We don't come at it from a competitive angle. Um, and we're there to, you know, make credentials and, and pass keys, you know, specifically in the FIDO Alliance work for users. Uh, one of the things that I, I feel like we managed to, you know, really get ahead of is, you know, er, I, I think early on this year, you saw a lot of press come out saying that, you know, pass keys are going to be a walled garden. They're a way to lock people into platforms and, mm -hmm. and keep people from, you know, moving off of, 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 of where they keep their credentials. And it's that's really not the case. We just really wanted there to be a secure way it, uh, for credentials to be moved because, you know, unlike pass keys, um, if you lose the the private key to the, the these these credentials, then uh, that then that's that's a that's a higher security concern because we're putting a lot more trust in these in these types of credentials than we are passwords in the past. Definitely. Now, the protocol does emphasize secure credential exchange in both online and offline scenarios. Uh, I, I think the question is a little obvious, but at the same time, I'd, I'd love to hear these nerdy details of uh, why it was important to support different network conditions, you know, because you've got some services that use the cloud for a lot of things, but then there may be times when you don't. So what um, what what led to the choice there? I'm I'm really glad you called this out. I was, I was saying to Dave right before the call, I was like, "This is a really nerdy question." I'm really glad to get like, yay, the the good ones. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, so we we really wanted to make uh, credential exchange work in uh, a variety of scenarios. Uh, right now, you know, as as we said, right, the default is a CSV um, that you know you have to kind of hope that users delete. Um, and if you if you want to you know, make sure that users are are going to do this securely. Um, well, not only do you need to support these like consumer cases where, you know, I'm just trying to move to a new provider, but you need to support these business cases, these more high assurance cases where, you know, being online may be, may, may not be available. Um, you know, you may be in a, a, a secure environment or you may be trying to move credentials from, you know, your uh, laptop in your office to a, a, a a rack in your data center and you may there may be a firewall in between or some air gap where you need to you need to be able to move those credentials uh with different uh network conditions or in, in cases where they can't reach out to the same uh services and back end 
one of the things that we we really explored in in credential exchange and are going to continue to develop is these enterprise specific flows these high assurance high security flows where the business actually has a lot more authority around the movement of credentials and could potentially um, apply things like policy or authorization certif uh, certif certificates um, and signing that could say that, you know, yeah, this user is allowed to use to move these credentials and only these types of credentials from this provider to this provider. Um, and then in the case of these certificates being there, you know, being online or offline may be an optional thing, but the business still has uh, the ability to authorize this movement. And that's something that's, you know, brand new and I think pretty uh, innovative in the space that we, we we worked on a lot in FIDO. Uh, one of the, the key features, of course, is the ability to securely move passkeys between providers. And I think from the outside looking in, you hear one company supports passkeys, another company supports passkeys, a password management platform supports passkeys. It seems like if we all have... Uh, if we all have the same little key, then moving my key from this place to this place and that place to that place should be easy. But there were clearly and are clearly challenges. What were the specific challenges or, or maybe maybe the biggest one or the biggest few that needed to be addressed for this credential exchange to be as simple as I imagine you all intend to make it? Yeah, I think. Oh, sorry, uh, David, go for it. Yeah. Oh no, I, I was just going to say that that it, in my mind, it and it's not. This is not a geeky answer, but it it boils down to being able to do it securely, right? That mm -hmm. right off the top. If we're going to move stuff between two points, you know, important stuff, it's got to be done in a very secure, trusted way. The second is 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 the data formats vary wildly. Um, you know, you try and move stuff between password managers today, and you get nominal levels of success because the way they define you know all the elements of a password versus say credit card information it's not the same you get some of the data coming over you miss pieces and so the value of having agreed upon data structures is actually a, as you know a huge value as well so that we get a much better quality of information exchange and it's easier to say uh, at a whole level i recognize this credential type or i don't in which case you can be really clear that, all right, the ones I recognized, I brought them in, but here are the ones that I didn't. And so you can give the end user a clear indication of what worked and what didn't work. Whereas today, yeah, some of the stuff might roll in and you really don't know what did and what didn't. Yeah, behind the scenes on a lot of these credential managers, the the plumbing is is very different. Um, so being able to, you know, have this protocol in, in place that is going to standardize how we, we communicate these credentials was, was uh, uh, the the biggest first step? Um, I think there's still a lot of work being done on you know behind the scenes and in, in at One Password, Dashlane, Bitwarden, and a lot of these orgs that we're working directly with, um, and we'll we'll you know have have a beta rollout of of CXP with shortly of uh, of just like making sure that we're able to uh, behind the scenes get these credentials uh, in the format they need to be exchanged and 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 work like we say they're going to work. Understood. Now. Let's talk about the future. <laughs> um, you know, these specifications, at least when I heard that this was coming through the pipeline, I thought, okay, this is it. Now I can get excited about pass keys without seeming like I am, I don't know, uh, thinking the earth is flat in the sense that people will actually believe me and be excited that this is the future. But I wanted to ask you uh, both, you know, do you think this is the last big hurdle for making pass keys uh, a more common form of of login or other other type of authorization uh, authentication? Excuse me, or do you still have some boxes that you're looking to check uh, in terms of getting, you know, my my cousins and my my uncles and everybody else who's not super steeped in technology on board with wanting to use them from a technology standpoint it's a big one uh because that lock-in notion or fear of lock-in was as, as nick said earlier in the year being discussed quite a bit out in the wild and um uh 
but it's uh, what's interesting is awareness is a big part of it too. Um, it's not just a technology. There aren't just technology gaps. There's just awareness gaps. People see passkey. They don't know what that is. They don't know if they should trust it. Um, the notion of doing things without a password on the surface sounds scary to people, even though it's more secure. So it's it, it, it the deployment is dependent on a variety of factors, not just the technical ones. But absolutely, this is a big big step forward on the technical side. Yeah, I think the 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 I mean, with, with regards to CXP, right? The first step is is allowing for for passkey portability, and we're actually you know going to come out. I mentioned that um, a, a, a few of us in the credential manager space, including Bitwarden, Dashlane, Google, um, One Password, are are going to work on supporting um, passkeys, passwords, and and some other. Um, it, it, information usually, I think, uh, addresses, credit cards, um, pretty pretty soon. Like we want to be able to support a broader range of credentials, and we see credential exchange protocol really being the first step in a, a broader conversation about where uh, credentials are headed. Uh, especially as we start seeing more digital credentials and MDLs, mobile drivers licenses, become more widely available. Um, we want to be able to support the movement and management of these credentials and allow for that user to have sovereignty over um, their credentials and, and, and uh, making them more portable. So uh, I think this is this is a huge leap for passkeys, especially as David said, we're kind of moving away from that fear of lock in. We're moving away from, um, you know, users feeling like they're going to if they're moving from new devices or moving to new apps that pass keys are going to be a risk uh to, to accessing things that they need we're just going to make them more available they're going to be available across um you know more credential managers and i think that's sort of a future that we're also planning for i think especially as we start talking about mobile drivers licenses and having uh digital wallets uh mm -hmm. become more widely used um it's gonna we're, we're gonna be entering sort of a, a future where you're not just gonna have one password or or, or, or dash lane or, or one credential manager you're gonna have multiple sources of credentials and we're all gonna be able we're, we're, we're all gonna need to talk to each other um and we see cxp as as a, as a, as a way to enable that um, which is, you know, why the, like the FIDO Alliance, we're starting with pass keys, but we're seeing, we're, we're building for the future. Yeah. So I add two things to that. Um, at the, the consumer level, uh, the, this notion of, well, they tell you're not supposed to do it, but everyone does, sharing your streaming service account password with a <laughs> yeah. family member. Um, you know, at this point, it's like copy it down or send in a text message and you still got to, you know, enter it in. This way, if you can give someone, and I won't name a particular service because they'll get mad, if you, you share the, the account information with them, it's in their password manager and it will simply work. So the usability of that scenario is actually much simpler. Um, it, it's the same with, you know, shared bank accounts. Um, some of my bank account or some of the, some accounts with my wife, we can only have one. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, so I have to share. We have to share. So again, this makes it simpler. And some of the pass key, uh, password manager tools actually give you more, uh, some control over that as well, so that that can be managed. Um, in addition, you actually have regulatory requirements uh, in the European Union. The EU they're developing a digital uh, wallet um, infrastructure, if you will, and one of the key requirements is uh, portability of data. That's a really big requirement in a lot of the EU um, cybersecurity and, and data areas is to make sure that end users aren't locked in to any one platform, any one product. And so this is the kind of tool that enables that capability, again, in a way that regulators will like it as opposed to, uh, again, doing it in an insecure and unreliable way. Yeah. I, I don't I don't think this is like the end of the line too for, for mm -hmm. what needs to be done on pass keys by any means. Um, and, and a lot of that work you know, it's not just being done in FIDO, it's being done in the W3C and the WebAuthn Working Group, which, you know, I'm also a part of and uh, David's involved with. It, it, we've been we've been working on this for seven or eight years and, it, you know, the work continues. Um, we're due to publish the next version of WebAuthn and the WebAuthn API um, in the next month or so. And that's going to include a lot of improvements around usability of of, of pass keys and and uh, the underlying APIs, which is defined by WebAuthn uh, in in there. So we're really interested in uh, in handling scenarios for uh, I'd say the more high security holdouts in the space, being able to make these more usable. Well, well, you know, usability for people is great. Usability for 
you know, your bank is also important. Banks and other um, high assurance, you know, payment service providers that, that experience a lot of fraud um, really want to make these uh, credentials uh, a, a strong, you know, a stronger replacement for for passwords, not just for them, but, you know, for their regulatory needs, as, as David mentioned. So, uh, we're adding a lot of things to support better, I, I'd say, usability, better signaling between um, applications and 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 your credential managers, being able to handle things like um, passive enrollment uh, and registration of pass keys is something that's coming down the line. So being able to go to a site, log in with your password, and then having one password pop up and say, hey, we saw you just logged in. Do you want to enroll a pass key? And we can just seamlessly uh, make a pass key right after login. Uh, with this site. So we think that's going to be a huge step forward um, in terms of usability and adoption. If we just make if we if we make that process easier and easier to just roll over to something more secure. Because you know, right now I, I a couple sites are have have a pretty great flow, but if you want to roll a passkey today, okay, well you log in, you go to your security settings, you mm -hmm. go to right add a passkey. You add the pass, you name the pass key, and it it just becomes this this certain amount of friction, and we really want to bring that friction down and 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 make it just as seamless as you know reg, reg, registering an account with a password. Absolutely. Well, David Turner, Nick Steele, I want to thank you both so much for taking the time to join me today to talk through this uh, update. I'm very much looking forward to seeing how this progresses. Um, is there a place where folks should go to kind of stay up to date with uh, what's making its way down the FIDO pipeline, as it were? Uh, FIDOalliance.org is our website, and that's probably the best starting point. Uh, you know, there's, there's from the top level, there'll be links down to both the, the, the Paskey-related documents themselves, but also uh, credential exchange information, too. Yeah, and you can follow me at, uh, at Kaiju on uh, Blue Sky. Um, I post there and have a couple lists of, of other folks like uh, Matthew Miller and Tim Capali who post a lot in the space and um, we'll, we'll keep you updated on where the spec's at. Actually, one other quick thing to add is that um, there are a lot of um, uh, open source initiatives in the same space trying to do this kind of transfer. And so we've taken a, a unique step with Fido and set up a, a repo in GitHub specifically to get feedback. Um, on these specifications. So there is a place, a direct place to provide comments. Uh, it's a publicly uh, available uh, repo. And again, it's on our <laughs> credential exchange download page. I don't remember off the top of my head the name of the repo, but if anyone has been looking at the specs and they have comments or feedback, uh, we do have a, a GitHub repo for that. Awesome. We're trying to Thank reach you out both. the broader community. Yeah. Definitely. We will link to all of that in our show notes. So folks listening in who are excited about it, be sure to head there to check it out. And thank you, David. Thank you, Nick, so much. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Bye. All righty, folks. Up next, I've got an interview about Apple's uh, upcoming Apple intelligence features. Before we get to that, though, I want to take a quick break to tell you about U.S. Cloud, who are bringing you this episode of Tech News Weekly. U.S. Cloud is the number one Microsoft Unified Support replacement. It's the global leader. U.S. Cloud is the global leader in third-party Microsoft Enterprise support, supporting 50 of the Fortune 500. Switching to U.S. Cloud can save your business 30% to 50% on a true comparable replacement for Microsoft Unified Support. U.S. Cloud supports the entire Microsoft stack 24-7, 365. They respond faster. They resolve tickets quicker for clients all around the world. And you can always talk to real humans. You can check out the proven track record for U.S. Cloud. Expert level engineers with an average of 14.9 years, and that's for break, fix, or DSE. 100% domestic teams, so your data never leaves the U.S. Financially backed SLAs, yeah, financially backed SLAs on response time. And initial ticket response averages are under four minutes. In 2023, 94% of U.S. Cloud's clients reported saving one-third or more when switching from Microsoft Unified Support to U.S. Cloud. From Fortune 500 companies and large health systems to major financial institutions and federal agencies, U.S. Cloud ensures that vital Microsoft systems are working for more than 6 million users globally every day. And big brands, they trust U.S. Cloud, including Caterpillar, HP, Aflac, Dun & Bradstreet, Under Armour, and KeyBank. Even the IT folks at Gartner have chosen U.S. Cloud for their Microsoft support needs. A director of information technology says, and within an hour, 
Within an hour, US Cloud responded with, I wanna say four engineers. So not only did they bring the right guys to the call, but they brought the cavalry. I just felt like, wow, that was amazing. That was unlike anything I had experienced with Microsoft in my eight years of being with Premier. We made the right choice. When it comes to compliance, no one gets it more than US Cloud. ISO, GDPR, ESG compliance are not just regulatory requirements, but strategic imperatives that drive operational efficiency, legal compliance, risk management, and corporate reputation. These standards foster trust and loyalty among customers and stakeholders. They attract investment and they ensure long-term sustainability and success in a competitive global market. Visit uscloud.com and book a call today to find out how much your team can save. That's uscloud.com to book a call today and get faster Microsoft support for less. And we thank US Cloud for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. Okay, we are back from the break, and that means it's time for our next topic. This time, we're talking about some upcoming Apple intelligence features that are already available in beta. Joining us to break it down is Six Colors East Bureau Chief. It's Dan Morin. Hello, Dan. Hello, Micah. I am ready to break all the things down, <laughs> up, break up, break left, break right. I'll break it every, every, any direction you want me to break, I'll break. Whoa, and they all mean something. They do, Up, down, left, right? right? Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Ooh, let's turn this into a linguistic show. It's going to be really fun. <laughs> <laughs> so let's kick things off. Um, of course, many of these features, well, actually, all of these features Apple announced a long time ago at WWDC um, and then sort of promoted them as features that one would get with new iPhones, uh, and that's upcoming. But none of these features are yet available. However, now that they're kind of more solidified, people are getting the first uh, look at them. I did uh, ask to join the wait list. I am not yet part of the wait list or part Welcome. of the, 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 Welcome to the wait list with the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's kick things off by talking about Image Playground. What is Image Playground and where will people be able to use it? Image Playground, perhaps the most contentious, I don't know, of Apple's Apple intelligence tools. Uh, it's very similar to a lot of other tools you might have seen that basically allow for generative AI being used to create images. So if you've seen the work of things like Midjourney or Dolly or Stable Diffusion, you're talking about something that's very similar, but it's something that Apple has sort of tuned to the ground up for its own specifications. It's going to appear in two specific places, at least to start with. The first of those is right within messages. So you'll be able to use that same little pop-up menu that you use to get at, um, you know, different gift search or your uh, check-in or whatever. And you can add image playgrounds from there as well. You'll be able to generate pictures there based on your own photos or based on prompts, which can either be sort of free form or can be sort of part of these pre-selected themes. Uh, it also will exist in a standalone app, which will include a library of all the images that you've generated, um, which you can get access to in there. Um, you can even create images to use in other apps like Pages or Keynote or what have you. Um, yeah, that's kind of the, the main thing about it. And, and Apple you know, is trying hard to, to create a technology that is safe right it's got to it's got to work within its own sort of uh you know image and brand and so it's doing that by primarily offering two major styles uh animation or illustration um and these sort of help prevent possible abuses right there's no photorealistic mode here it's not generating pictures that look like photos everything is very clearly you know illustrated or animated in some way uh, and they have a bunch of guardrails in place to prevent certain kinds of content that might be objectionable from being generated. Or so they say, we haven't got a chance to test it yet, but that in theory is what's happening here. Now, the next feature um, is one that I think where, where Image Playground feels a little bit more, it's kind of a, it's mostly an app. It's, it's sort of a, a feature that you you call upon. Uh, the next feature feels a more a little bit more universal. Uh, it's Genmoji. Um, can you tell us about Genmoji and why it sounds like emoji? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were gonna say it sounds like my friend Jen Genmoji. Um, oh, Jen! I know Jen. <laughs> uh, so Genmoji is basically it's the ability to create emoji. 
uh, based on a text prompt. So if you've ever felt like there is an emoji, you that why why is there a no emoji for uh, shrimp on toast? Why? Everybody Why? needs a shrimp on toast emoji. I, I, you know this. I know this. <laughs> uh, and so you can just type in shrimp on toast, and it will generate a couple different options for you. You can select that, and then you can essentially use it in messages like you would use an emoji. You can send it in line. You can send it as a sticker. You can use it as a tap back. And anybody else who is on a compatible version of an Apple platform will be able to see it just as if it was a regular emoji. Uh, wild, cool, kind of fun. Um, I, it will even recognize like. Uh, people from your contacts and kind of try to generate emoji that look like them. So if you specify, like if I tried to make a mica emoji, it would try to like recreate your look a little bit, you know, maybe the beard, the hair, it'll look good. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think this is kind of cool and, and should be fun. But uh, again, we're waiting to see exactly how well it works. Yeah. The last one was one that I honestly forgot about. <laughs> uh, the last of the the kind of uh, sort of image generation things. And so I was very happy to get to read through Music Scholar's piece to remember what in the world image wand is. Image wand. Image wand. Abracadabra. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it is. It's magic. Uh, so this is something that Apple's incorporating into the Apple Pencil tools. You'll see it as a in that palette of tools. You know, we can pick like a pencil or a highlighter or whatever. You'll see this image wand thing. And it basically lets you just sort of uh, either take some sort of like a drawing or a sketch that you have made and then turn it into a polished image. Or even in cases where you might just want to supplement some text that you have with a picture, you can sort of, you know, designate an area and it will generate a drawing based on the text that's around it. So if you're mm -hmm. doing, you know, a book report or a paper or something for school, maybe, and you want to add a little, you know, pizzazz, you can just <laughs> add a insert an image and it will read through and try to generate something that kind of matches and draws from the text that you have written. I don't know that my teachers would have liked it if I just started putting pictures in all my papers, but... Uh, it could have been fun, that's for sure. It's like clip art, basically, but you know, a little more uh, magical. Because the one, this is my report of shrimp on toast. <laughs> shrimp on toast. And Why it's I delicious? Just keep adding shrimp on toast <laughs> images all you throughout. Can go wrong. Here's a photo of a shrimp. Here's a photo of some toast. And we put Here's them a together. Photo of shrimp on toast. <laughs> um, okay, and then I was excited to see that writing tools, which are already available in the 0.1 beta that will soon be shipping to uh, your average consumer who doesn't jump on beta trains uh, very soon, writing tools are getting some improvements. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, there's one major improvement here and then something else I think we'll talk about in a second. But the in previously, when you have used the writing tools, it's offered a limited number of options in terms of enhancing your writing. You can say, for example, to make something professional or concise or friendly, right? It kind of is just giving you a pre-selected menu of things to do. Well, starting in uh, these next updates, you'll be able to describe a specific change that you want to make. You'll be able to enter a prompt, uh, for example, making something read like a poem or you know, making something funnier or something like that. It will try to actually follow the instructions you give it. So it's a little bit more open-ended, a little bit more freeform in terms of the text that it's generating. Got it. Okay, yeah, so you can, that makes more sense. It's it's about instead of kind of following along these very specific guardrails, although there are guardrails still in place, but these are different there are guardrails. Still, yes. But like, yeah, you can just right, yeah, rather it's letting you order yes. off menu, right? Rather, it's like, yeah. oh, what if I I see there's no shrimp on toast on your menu? What if I want to order that? You can just type it in the <laughs> box and it'll generate it. Um, while we all ponder shrimp on toast, <laughs> believe it or not, we're actually going to take one quick little break before we come back with the rest of what's upcoming in the next version of the next next version of ios uh i want to tell you about our friends at aci learning who are bringing you this episode of tech news weekly aci learning is the provider of it pro that binge worthy video on demand it and cybersecurity training with it pro you will get certification ready with access to the full video library of more than 7250 hours of training Premium training plans also include practice tests to ensure you're ready before you pay for exams and virtual labs to facilitate hands-on learning. IT Pro from ACI Learning makes training fun. All training videos are produced in an engaging talk show format that is truly 
edutaining. Take your IT or cyber career to the next level. Be bold and train smart with ACI Learning. Visit info.acilearning.com slash twit and use code twit100 at checkout to save 30% on your first year of IT Pro annual training plans. That's info.acilearning.com slash twit with the code twit100. All righty. Thank you, ACI Learning, for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. Let's head back to the show where we are joined by Dan Morin of Six Colors, who's giving us a preview of an upcoming version of iOS 18 that will support more of the Apple intelligence features that have yet to make their way to everyone, even still. It's very complicated. It's very confusing. Could you use writing tools to make that a little more concise, maybe? That would Just be really, nice. yeah, speaking yeah. tools. That's coming next. <laughs> because iOS 18, as it stands, does not have the version that has the current set of non image generation tools. That's coming, we hear, next week as we record this show on Thursday. And then at some point in the future, we will see the version that we're talking about now. But those of us who are using the beta will see this version now, except you have to join a wait list to actually gain access to those features. So many of us haven't even seen them now, even though we technically have access to them now, but don't have access to them now. This is messy, Dan. Can you remember a time <laughs> that this has ever been the situation with, with Apple's like beta program? Have there ever been features like this that had a wait list? Not to my recollection, honestly. I mean, the beta landscape for Apple obviously has changed a lot in the last decade or so. I mean, it used to be really locked down to developers. And then, of course, they've added public beta stuff as well. Um, and then more recently, it's been easier to get the developer betas. And then they've had this weird, like, this is, I think, the first time in my memory where they really had these parallel beta tracks, too. Because even before 18.0 came out for iOS, there, were, there was an 18.1 beta. And I, mm -hmm. I could not remember having that ever in any of my experiences, like where there were two betas for different versions, neither of which were out yet. So, and yeah. we're still in that world because currently there is both the 18.1 beta in both developer and public beta flavors, as well as the 18.2 developer beta. So yeah, it is, it's a mess right now for sure. For sure. It felt like Microsoft. Uh, Ooh, that's just feels like a, I know, I know, I know, but that is such a Microsoft thing. Um, back to it. One thing that uh, is part of this version that people do have access to, they don't have to wait for the wait list, is integration with a generative AI platform. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. And specifically in this case, we're talking about ChatGPT. Apple has suggested in the past that they might be interested in expanding that to other generative AI models, but as of yet, they have not announced any other partnerships. So with this system, you'll have ChatGPT, which you can access in a couple different ways, the first of which is via Siri. You'll be able to either explicitly ask for ChatGPT to give you an answer. You can say like, hey, so-and-so, ask ChatGPT to generate me a poem about shrimp on toast. And it will be able to go to ChatGPT and get that information and return it to you. And Apple has built in a number of sort of safeguards here, including, you know, in many cases, prompting you before it sends any information to ChatGPT. Because this doesn't require you to have a ChatGPT account, uh, by default, that information is not stored and it can't be linked back to you. Your IP address is hidden, so it can't be, you know, collated with other requests that you might make. Um, all of that is sort of locked down and, and part of, you know, why Apple wants to continue its brand of privacy. Uh, in addition to that, um, you, you'll be able to even disable that entire integration at the beginning if you want to. You will give them the option whether or not you want to allow Siri to work with ChatGPT. Um, Siri will also then dynamically try to figure out if the query you are asking it, if you do not explicitly ask for ChatGPT, might be better served by ChatGPT. So you ask Siri for something and it's using some sort of algorithm. Apple hasn't really detailed how it's making that determination other than what are the things that Siri is well suited to versus what are the things that ChatGPT is well suited to. So one example might be if you wanted to uh, plan a list of places to go in a city you were visiting. 
Siri might say, oh, okay, I can't really do that, or I don't have that information. I'm going to hand this off to ChatGPT. And again, you will be prompted before that happens um, to say like, oh, hey, I'm going to send this to ChatGPT. Is that okay? Similarly, you might be able to send other image, like information like images to ChatGPT, which will also be sort of prompted and and you know disclosed at the time. Like, hey, you've taken this picture that you want to send to ChatGPT to get to respond with something. Just to let you know, we're gonna we're gonna do that. The other thing which is interesting is that in addition to these tools, as part of the writing tools we discussed earlier, there is now a compose option. So you can tell the writing tools to generate text for you on the fly, not just rewrite text or proofread text, but create new text. And that will also leverage ChatGPT. And that is available anywhere within the system-wide writing tools. So that's one other place that you can do that. And in addition to the writing aspect, you can even use ChatGPT's Chat image generation capabilities to add images too. So oh. that's kind of a backdoor into the ChatGPT stuff. Now, Apple will also let you, if you have a ChatGPT account, you can log in with that. Just be aware that then those that information will sort of accrue to your account. So like, you know, it will know who you are and it will have that information and remember that information, et cetera. So you don't need an account, but you can log into it and integrate with that if you already have one. And then another feature that people who are on this beta have access to is visual intelligence, which is a feature that was tied to a hardware feature uh, yeah. on the new iPhones. Tell us about uh, visual intelligence. Yeah, so this is linked in with the camera control feature on the iPhone 16 line. Uh, and basically, you'll be able to use it to point the camera at something and then get more information about it. So for example, if you're in front of a restaurant, you could maybe point at your phone at it and use visual intelligence to get the reviews, or you could find the hours that it's open. It can also summarize text on the fly if you point it at some text. Uh, it can translate between languages. It can scan QR codes, uh, and it does even have uh, integrations with some third-party tools, such as using Google to search for where you could buy something, or even using, again, ChatGPT to get expertise about a particular subject matter. Uh, so all of those things are kind of linked together. It's very similar to what Google has been doing for some time with its lens feature. And certainly uh, Meta, I think, has also been trying to leverage with its uh, Meta Ray-Bans. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things are kind of places where they're trying to figure out, you know, how do you leverage this information coming into the camera and use uh, artificial intelligence or to get more information about it? I would like to see personally the ability to like get recipe, like, you know, we, they have this thing in, in, I think it's in photos in iOS 18 where you can look at a picture of food and it like will find recipes for that dish. So you could like take a picture of shrimp on toast and it would tell you how to make shrimp on toast, for example. I think that'd be handy. <laughs> um, I, I had used it um, and I, thought that it was a pretty cool feature with the kind of three different options. I like took a photo of a mug and it knew the name of the company that was on the mug and provided some information about that. And then when I use it with Google, it tried to find a mug that was like it. There isn't one. This is a really <laughs> old mug. Um, and then I, you know, did the standard version and it was, yeah, it was neat seeing the different uh, options that were available there. I think I could find myself using visual intelligence um, more than most of these features. Uh, and then last, but I don't want to make it least um, more English support, which I think is... <laughs> interesting to people outside of the US, right? It, it, this this new set of features, some of them are reaching more people who speak English. Yeah, I like more English support because it sounds incredibly ungrammatical, even though yeah. being 100% accurate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, the initial Apple intelligence features are only available in English. However, in these new releases, Apple is expanding that to more geographic locales. So beyond just the United States, you'll be able to access these features in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, or the UK. You'll have to set your uh, div like Siri language to that specific uh, English localization. Uh, and then you'll be able to use those features and have them work, you know, in, in conjunction with your localized version of English. And my understanding is I think that means they would have worked previously if you had been in those regions, but just set Siri to US English. I think that might have worked. But obviously, now it's it's more specifically tuned to those particular uh, versions of English. Understood. Well, Dan, when do we think people <laughs> who are not 
on the betas and not on the wait lists, the average user will see these features this year or next year? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. So if we are taking it as read that the first set of Apple intelligence tools will ship to everybody next week, which would be the end of October, it feels to me like probably the, the earliest we'd, we'd see these tools is sometime in December. And I think depending on the process and, and Apple is by all accounts using some of the feedback about these tools to make decisions about how ready they are for prime time and for the average user. So I think the average user is more likely to see them in January, potentially, if that stuff gets pushed back. Um, but it's also worth noting that as with 18.1, it seems likely that a public beta of this will appear at some point, and that would probably happen before the end of the year. So if you are still willing to live on the not quite as bleeding edge, but still somewhat bleeding edge, you may have an opportunity to use this. Uh, as for the waitlist stuff, it's unclear. Uh, Apple has said in the past with the waitlist that they you know, expect them to take a matter of hours. Uh, I think you, like me, probably put in pretty early for this uh, uh, recent waitlist for the image tools, which is a separate waitlist from Apple Intelligence. Uh, and I've had that for more than 24 hours now, and it's still pending. So it really depends on demand, it looks like, for how many people are are hitting the servers. I, they're clearly trying to meet that out a bit so that it's you know not hammering those those servers. But uh, yeah, yeah, we'll have to see how that keeps going. Yes, we shall. And we'll also see what Max Apple announces over the coming uh, mm. weeks as well, as that is also in the pipeline. Dan Morin of Six Colors, thank you so much for being here with us this week. If people want to follow along with what you're doing, where is the best way to go do that? The best way to go do that is you can follow me on any social media, pretty much as D Morin. I'm also at dmorin.com, D M O R E N.com. And I'm currently registering the handle at shrimp on toast at as many <laughs> possible sites as I can. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Uh, thank you so much, Dan. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Mike. Take it easy. All righty, folks, that is the show. Uh, Tech News Weekly publishes every Thursday at twit.tv slash TNW. That is where you go to subscribe to the show in audio and video formats. I want to mention that if you'd like to get all of our shows ad free, well, check out Club Twit. It's just $7 a month. And when you join the club, you gain access to, as I mentioned, every single Twitch show with no ads. Also access to the Twit Plus bonus feed that has extra stuff you won't find anywhere else behind the scenes, before the show, after the show, special Club Twit events get published there. Access to the members only discord server which is a fun place to go to chat with your fellow club twit members and those of us here at twit and also look at photos of shrimp on toast um and honestly it looks appetizing and access to the video versions of our club twit exclusive shows like hands on windows hands on mac ios today and uh many more so be sure to join the club seven dollars a month we would love to have you. Uh, and I should also mention that if you are a member of the club, consider getting some free months of Club Twit by referring your friends to the club. Head to twit.tv slash club twit slash referral. And there you will learn more about the referral program that grants you months of Club Twit for free. If you'd like to follow me online, I'm at Micah Sargent on many a social media network where you can head to chihuahua.coffee. That's C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee where I've got links to the places I'm most active online. Uh, be sure to check out my shows. That's where I'm going next. Uh, on Sunday, you can watch Hands on Tech. Uh, and then later today, you'll be able to watch Hands, the latest episodes of Hands on Mac and iOS Today. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in, and I will catch you again next week for another episode of Tech News Weekly. Bye-bye.